Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hey everyone, welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard and I am excited. I've been trying very uh, for quite some time to bring you this guest because it's a topic that I think we all want to talk about, especially if we're building blockchain businesses and, and crypto-based businesses that we're thinking about, where are we going to locate ourselves? What are we going to do? Where is the environment that is going to nurture my growth and be right for my business? And some of those choices we make are, we make them in the very early stage, like when we form our company. So I heard uh, from a from a listener who sent me a tweet with a video interview with her, and I said, "That's it. I have to get her." And it's taken me quite a few months, but I am so glad to finally have Caitlin Long on my show. Caitlin is a 22 year Wall Street veteran who has been active in Bitcoin and blockchain since 2012, way longer than me. Uh, she has been leading the charge to make her native state of Wyoming an oasis for blockchain companies in the U.S., where she has helped Wyoming enact. 13 blockchain enabling laws. We're going to talk about those in 2018 and 2019. And from 2016 to 2018, she spearheaded a blockchain project for delivering market index data to Vanguard as chairman and president of Symbiont, an enterprise blockchain start startup. Caitlin ran Morgan Stanley's pension solutions business at Credit Suisse um, and oh, had held senior, senior roles at Credit Suisse and began her career at Solomon Brothers. She is a graduate of Harvard Law School, Kennedy School of Government, and the University of Wyoming. And Caitlin, I'm so glad to have you here. Oh, Tracy, it's my honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a, a, a hot topic amongst uh corporate organizers, so company organizers. So I talked to someone who was like, you know, being Nevada for a really long time. And then there's those Delaware ones. And now Wyoming's popping up as being an oasis. But what I heard you um, talk about that really caught my ear was really understanding what made it right for business, not just what it made it right for financial data and that kind of information. So tell a little bit about why you got excited about and interested in being a blockchain advocate and being that type of making Wyoming an oasis, as you put it. Well, I'm a Wyoming girl through and through, uh, born and raised here and lived away for 29 years total, of which 25 were in the New York area, either in the city or the burbs. Um, and uh, I ran a couple of businesses on Wall Street, and one of which was the pension solutions business at Morgan Stanley, as you mentioned. And I saw some things that were just really unfair and they hit me in the gut. And, um, you know, it just, it, it all pertained to inaccurate ledgers. And some of the issues are accidental and a vestige of history that just haven't been fixed yet because of inertia. But some of them are also nefarious. There are people out there who know how to how to work the system, so to speak, and you know, try to double dip in, in, in a couple of instances that I know of. And they were stealing money from pensioners, stealing money from mom and pop in those, um, in those situations. And it just was wrong. And uh, that, I was experiencing that around about the time that this whole concept of enterprise blockchain cropped up. I met Ripple in very early days. It was early 2014. And, um, you know, in the beginning, as, as, as I wasn't sure that, that Bitcoin had application to the mainstream financial system. But when Ripple came along, it, that, that set light bulbs off in my head. Oh, my gosh, we can apply this technology to mainstream assets as well. I've gone full circle um, <laughs> from a, a detour in enterprise blockchain. There are a few of us in the industry who have. Um, and, you know, there certainly are benefits that, that distributed systems um, like like distributed ledger technology can have in enterprise contexts, 
but I'm now back full circle, as I think a lot of others who, who did the same detour um, have concluded that really it's, it's the truly decentralized platforms that are the most powerful technology and they're the ones that are going to be making the, the system fair. Um, in terms of the connection to Wyoming, Wyoming is a very independent place. Um, it, it, it is. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the state that gave women the right to vote 50 years before the, the United States uh, did as a, you know, in the U.S. Constitution. Um, and uh, actually, when, when Wyoming gave women the right to vote, uh, Congress said, all right, we won't make you a state until you remove that. And Wyoming said, well, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll wait. Um, and then ultimately they did. Um, remove it. And, you know, like so many things in history, it's not a total black and white story. Um, they voted to give women the right to vote because they didn't have enough people here to become a state. Uh, and then the next year they took it back, um, but it didn't, it, but it didn't pass by a veto proof majority. So the law stood. So, it, you know, it's just an interesting history, but the, those vignettes are important because it gives you some sense for the culture here. Um, and there's something very important also it, it, along the lines of business entity formations, Wyoming invented the limited liability company in 1977. So we have a history a little over 40 years ago of inventing interesting things with new technologies. And um, Wyoming actually is number two behind Delaware. We recently surpassed Nevada for the number that the, the states with the highest number of new business entity registrations because of that LLC history. And because of the fact that we really truly believe that, you know, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. We don't think the government should be uh, grabbing people's assets. So um, taxes are very, very low here. Um, and that's why we surpassed Nevada. I love that. I love that history that you've given me. No problem. I don't mean to be coughing in your ear. That's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, I love that, that little bit of Wyoming history you gave us there because, Excellent. you know, it's such an interesting uh, concept to um, the, the basis for how am I going to form my company and what is my company going to be about? I think that that's, you know, that's as principled a decision as you can make. It's not just about, Hey, I want to take advantage of some laws or anything, but it's starting to think about like, where's my corporate value? What is it going to be? How am I, how, am I returning that to its investors? And what is all of that, that going to do? And being thinking about that sort of basic level of where am I going to form it starts with that thought process as well. So having that, that the uh, state be in the spirit of that as well is, is a great benefit. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting because Wyoming created the LLC to take on the, the very strict rules that Delaware has for corporations, and those rules are applicable to large, ongoing, you know, publicly traded companies. But it's really tough for a startup to comply yes. with a lot of those corporate rules. And so, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of times what happens is startups will start as LLCs, and then if they are successful, eventually they convert to a corporation, um, precisely because they don't want to have to start with meeting all those corporate requirements off the bat. Um, but what's interesting is that um, venture capital still definitely has a preference for Delaware corporations. Um, and, and I think Wyoming is going to eat into that pretty fast <laughs> for two reasons. We actually, uh, well, number one, we have a, actually three. We, we, we don't charge corporate tax. Delaware charges corporate tax and franchise tax. So, um, you know, eventually companies are going to look at that and say, why am I paying all this money when I can get the same benefits in a different state for a lot less money? Um, and think about the present value of all those fees. When you add them up, it's pretty significant to, to Delaware. It's a high tax state. Um, and then on top of that, what Delaware always had the what's called a chancery court, a business court, where litigation um, um, it, it happens with business savvy judges. Wyoming set one of those up. It was the last leg of, of the stool for Wyoming that, that really um, makes us a destination for business. And uh, stay tuned because I think um, lawyers are going to very quickly not only see that we probably adopt Delaware corporate law precedent, case law precedent, um, but also in the crypto space, we've already had litigation. So we're starting to actually have not only case law precedent in, in, in the crypto area in Wyoming, but also the judges and the bar in Wyoming is starting to get up to speed. And, the, and we're going to beat Delaware and Nevada and all other states on that because this is the place where crypto is going to end up, I think, uh, being domiciled and litigated 
Um, and, and so, you know, those, those things that the, um, oh, and then I, and, um, the third thing I was going to mention, Nevada put a gross receipts tax in place, really. So you've got Delaware, which among the top three destinations for business registration is, a, is clearly the highest tax, but it's also, you know, the incumbent. And then Nevada put a gross receipts tax in place. And as soon as Wyoming, as Nevada did that, Wyoming leapfrogged them. So um, <laughs> yeah. we've, got a, we've got a history of, of uh, respecting people's property here to the greatest degree possible. And, and, uh, and, and so I think, you know, you're going to see crypto companies come here. We'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, about the, the special purpose depository institutions that are going to definitely b- bring companies here as well. Well, and, and that's kind of what I wanted to tap into next is, you know, really what, you know, you've, you put in some laws and some, and, and some different things in place. So let's, let's lay the basis for what happened in 2018 and 2019 with what, what's put in place specifically for corporations to, uh, to, to be attractive, to be that oasis that you talked about before. Yeah. So, so speaking specifically from a, a new business startup perspective, what are the things you care about? Well, there's already no corporate tax. There's already privacy in LLCs. The state of Wyoming does not collect much information about its LLC registrants. So privacy is, is, a, is a big benefit here as well. So those are the great building blocks. And then on top of that, we specifically exempted crypto from property taxes. Um, and then we exempted crypto from the money transmission statute. So if you're going to be handling crypto as an exchange or a lending company or a custodian, you actually don't need a money transmission law uh, license in Wyoming for that. Um, we created the utility token bill, um, which, which is the first in the, in the uh, really, I think, in the world. Well, no, we were behind Switzerland, but first U.S. state to acknowledge that there is such a thing as a consumptive token that is not a security, even though it's issued in these, in these, um, in these sit- systems. Uh, and then we also created series LLCs, um, which probably mo- won't apply to most companies, but there will be a few of you for whom that's meaningful, especially software foundations that want to have a parent company hold- holding the license and then dropping you know, a bunch of child LLCs off that parent company. It can be a cost-effective way to set up a lot of LLCs you know, where you've got a common interest like that. Then, um, it, this, in 2019, earlier this year, we got eight more done. One is a fintech sandbox. So again, if you're, um, if, if you're in an area where you might not t- technically qualify for a license because you're doing something new and unusual, you actually have a way to get exempted for up to three years um, from the statutes. You just have to let the regulators know who you are and what your business is. Um, uh, we, we have... Um, there were there were probably the most important bill is the one that may not be applicable as much to businesses to startups in this space but it's really important to everybody in the space which is we defined the rights and obligations under the law of parties in a crypto transaction um, why is that important because again if you get if you get into a legal dispute you know the crypto falls into the gray area in the United States and um, you don't really know how a judge is going to act. And so having some certainty on how a judge is, gonna, is going to look at the rights and obligations of parties to a transaction that ends up in a dispute, that's huge. It may or may not be relevant to your business, but it's a pretty basic, um, a, Trace Mayer calls it a protocol layer of the legal system topic, right? It's very boring, but it's actually in every transaction commercially that we do, that's governed by commercial law. And there wasn't any definition whatsoever regarding crypto. And as we take that to the next level, that is important also because crypto is an asset that you should be able to pledge as collateral for loans. And so there was no clarity on how to perfect a security interest, which is what lawyers call creating an enforceable lien against collateral. And so basically all the crypto lenders are just doing it by contract. But frankly, if there's a dispute, you know, you're back to that uncertainty, that legal uncertainty, and a judge isn't necessarily going to respect your your contract if he doesn't think it complies with the law, right? So this is pretty basic but really important stuff, and that all feeds into what we're what we're doing then with the special purpose depository institution and crypto custodians. Now in that that's really really interesting. I want to get to that in a moment, but what what's the ideal type of startup of of company that you want to attract? Is there is there a specific type that you think Wyoming it's ideal? 
No, no, any and all. Anybody who wants to take advantage of a low tax state that um, gives you definition in your in the statutes for for crypto and exempts you from money transmission license requirements for being here. Um, that's that I know that basically that describes pretty much 99% of the crypto startups that are looking to be onshore in the United States. The tax point, it is worth saying, um, being a, a state within the United States, you're not exempt from federal taxes. Uh, so um, it's you still have to pay the federal taxes, but the state taxes um, are, are, do not apply to crypto in Wyoming. That's very clear. Great. And you still, for everyone out there, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, you all have to consult with your tax attorneys, your attorneys, Absolutely. your regular things for your, because if you're not car. domiciled and actually in operating in business in Wyoming, you may have to register as a foreign yeah. corporation. That's what we have to do here in California, which is just such a mess and a disaster anyway. So it, it makes it more difficult. So make sure that you're getting good advisors here. But let's talk about your special <laughs> depository because that is a really cool and interesting concept yeah. that you guys have created there. And I think it's a very big attraction point. Yes, it is. And, and by next spring, I think there will be four or five of them open in Wyoming if all goes well. And um, these are bank licenses. Okay, so it, it takes six to nine months to start to stand up a new bank. Um, and they have to go through a Federal Reserve process too because the law requires them to get what's called a Fed Master account. So um, I'm, I'm definitely letting everybody know this is not a sure thing. These are not simple processes, but there is a group of five that have indicated an interest in, in applying applications just opened last week. Um, there's nothing to announce yet, um, but I think uh, you're gonna see over the next several weeks, a couple of companies actually announcing that they applied. What's special about it? Lots of things. Um, we really nailed it. And I was just on a, on a call today, a continuing legal education call with, De with lawyers from Devavoys in New York, talking about all the issues in crypto. And in part, thanks to them, we addressed all of them, um, in crypt all of the issues in crypto custody. Um, so what's special about it? Uh, some of your listeners are probably going, what the hell are we doing setting up a bank that's a custodian of crypto. Um, when yeah, that seems kind of counterintuitive. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. It's it's really it's two things. One is these these will be the first actual banks that the crypto industry itself controls, um, because there will these are crypto companies applying for the license, and they get their own Fed Master account, which means that they don't have to worry about losing access to basic banking services, which has been a perennial problem in this industry. Um, and, you know, it's pretty much for all startups kind of a given that you have to have two or three bank accounts. I've watched it happen with startups where you lose access to a bank and literally you're out of business. Because to be a business in the United States, you have to have a bank account, unfortunately. So um, it is a blocking issue and a lot of companies in this industry have lost bank accounts. So um, there will be crypto companies that actually have access to the Fed and can handle their own wires and control their own destiny. Um, they have to do all their, you know, know your customer, customer and anti-money laundering analysis, um, but they're handling it themselves instead of um, relying on a third party. That's pretty big. And I think you'll be surprised at who shows up um, and, and who values that. Um, and then the second thing is it acknowledges that there are some owners of crypto who unfortunately by law have to use a third party custodian. And what I'm referring to there is institutional investors who have to comply with the SEC custody rule. So this is mutual funds, ETFs, um, and, and, and the like. Most pension funds and endowments and foundations also voluntarily comply with the same rule or have their own specific rules that say that the managers are not allowed to, to have custody of the assets they manage. You have to actually separate that due to a bunch of fraud that took place in the 1930s in the US. So, you know, I look at blockchain technology and say that's your custodian right there. But the SEC doesn't agree with that. And until, um, until that law changes, which is not likely to happen anytime soon, then any institutional adoption beyond hedge funds or venture capital funds, which are the highest risk, you know, portions of the institutional market, um, it's just, it's impeded by not having a qualified custodian. So we specifically set up a bank. It's a bank, not a trust company. Um, it's not FDIC insured. It cannot lend. So it's a 100% reserve bank. And under the law, the bank must, when they hold assets in trust, crypto assets in trust for customers, they must hold one for one reserves. 
So they're not able to do this, these games that I saw in the traditional financial industry where they're playing three card Monty with your assets behind the scenes. Moreover, we have a specific protection for investors called a bailment. A bailment is an old common law concept that says that it's, it's just like a valet parking arrangement for your car or a coat check. When you deposit your car at a parking garage and get your claim check, you're not handing the garage title to your assets. Right. You're actually just at hiring them as a service provider and they're allowed to do one and only one thing, which is park your car and then give it back to you when you ask for it. That's not how financial services works. Most people don't understand, even in, in their brokerage account, they don't own the securities. What's in their brokerage account is an IOU. So effectively, that'd be a, the equivalent of you, of you when, when you park your car, you're handing over title to your car and they give you an IOU back and they might not give you the actual car back when you want it back. And meanwhile, they're running around with your car, um, leasing it out to Uber and pocketing all the profits um, and you're taking all the risk without even knowing it. That's right. how the financial services industry works. And that's why we get the shenanigans we get. Um, but in Wyoming, that is expressly illegal. <laughs> so um, I love that. so it's, a, it's a very <laughs> investor friendly, yeah, it's a very investor friendly um, approach. And it's directly aimed at taking on New York, which, uh, you know, frankly, they're so focused on the wrong things from a regulatory perspective. They let all of this three card Monty, you know, you, you deposit your car at the garage and they run around and earn money on it without, you know, maybe they'll throw you a little bit of it, but, and, and oh, by the way, they don't have to give you your actual car back. They might give you your same, you know, make and model year. That's the way financial services works. Um, and we do, that's, and that is all legal in New York. It's the kind of basic stuff that shouldn't be, but it is. Yeah. And uh, yet New York is focused on all this other stuff when they should be focused on the basic stuff, which is when you put your money into a financial institution, is that financial institution solvent and are they going to give it back to you when you want it? Yeah. You know what? It's so interesting that you bring this up. So I, I did a speech in front of 200 um, women in the investment community in New York City this summer. And wow. I was talking awesome. and I was just giving them a little background on, you know, I I, you may not realize this, but I was a blockchain skeptic about, oh, it was not even two years ago. So I was a complete skeptic about it. As I was like, you know, were. yeah, <laughs> I'm not time. really sure about sure. this thing, right? I don't know what's going to happen here. And I can't say I've totally come around on like Bitcoin and crypto in general, but I have definitely come around on, on blockchain. And it was really, it was doing an interview with Steve Wozniak that changed my perspective. And so I thought, uh, so I was asked to cover a conference for Inc. Magazine and I, I went to the conference to meet up with him and um, interview him. And I interviewed a bunch of other people at the same time and got this broader exposure to what was going on in blockchain and crypto that I didn't understand before, depth, in depth enough. And what I really saw there though, wow. was that solutions to problems and that's, and solutions to dissatisfaction. And, and that's exactly what I saw when, when I was trying to explain to the women in New York, I was saying to them is like, look, Steve Wozniak was explaining to me that he was excited about it because it preserves the creator's value. It's yeah. in the ledger, right? You yeah. invented this. You created this. People built off of that. They owe you money if it's that's if that's in the in the deal. But it's there that you did this, and that was really important to him. And that's you know, I am an inventor, and I believe in that as well. So that's part of it. But in the in the banking community and what's going on, one woman walk up to me after I spoke about you know my my interest in this in this blockchain and what's going on in the space. She walked up to me and she said, "I work for Chase Bank." And we've been spending millions and millions of dollars on this blockchain thing. And I didn't understand before why. And she's like, and I said, well, the one thing you haven't considered is that your banking system is not only in a way broken in yeah. terms of what it, you know, it, that it's broken to the consumer. They see it's brokenness too, which you don't realize is like when it's in the industry, you see it as broken because you understand this isn't quite right. This isn't quite how it should yeah. work. But Most the consumers understand. really yeah. see it. And we yeah. have a generation of people who don't understand uh, you have a batch to close. Like that's archaic, right? And so even your, <laughs> your actual architecture that is built on is broken. So you might totally. as well you totally. might as well blow it all up and start something new, really. Be you so that's why they're investing. And she said, That's the the first explanation I've heard that makes sense to me. And I was yeah. like, Okay, well, good. Glad you get that. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and it's interesting because in the beginning when I was at Morgan Stanley, everybody around me was skeptical. And the way I pitched it to people was it solves the duplication reconciliation problem. There's so much redundancy and expenses in the industry where everybody keeps their own copy of a of data and then reconciles against each other. And literally there's entire back offices, tens of thousands of people working in the, in the financial industry who do nothing but that. Um, and, and if you think about it, if you had an honest ledger that everybody could share, you don't need any of that. And, and that is a paradigm shift, no question. And that's why it's, the, that, that's why it's been slow. That's why a lot of the enterprise stuff really truly has, has not gone as well as people thought like me in the beginning that it would because we were looking at it going, there's so much expense redundancy in the system, we should take it out. But it turns out there are also, you know, there's inertia, there's fear. Um, the, those bank IT stacks are, you know, some of them are still have COBOL at the very bottom, right? And people are afraid of what happens if we take out, uh, you know, a system and something breaks. And, and candidly, there, that, that's an issue at every one of the big banks. I um, think it so, is. You're right. <laughs> yeah. So they're not interested in, in rip and replace. They're, they're more interested in incremental. Um, but I think Andreas Antonopoulos says, says it right, that this is, we're basically just, we saw the same thing in the development of, of the internet. It, we saw the walled garden intranets happening first. And then um, once people got comfortable with the technology, the internet itself flourished. Everybody opened up their systems. Everybody's got APIs now. And, um, you know, we, it's, it's, it's a giant mesh network. But that's not the way Wall Street works right now. There is a lot of incumbency, but there are also a lot of people who make a lot of money off the existing system, right? So right. the Dole Food case is the, is the example that just, it's exhibit A for why the status quo system is broken, unstable, and unfair. And that is, there were 36.7 million Dole Food shares outstanding, publicly traded company. Company was acquired. There was a class action lawsuit and there was a settlement. So all the shareholders were gonna get like another $1.25. And 49.2 million claims were filed for the 36.7 million shares outstanding. And when they looked at it, guess what? All 49.2 million had valid brokerage statements, right? So the bookkeeping systems of Wall Street created one third more shares, Dole Food, one third more claims to Dole Food shares than there were actual Dole Food shares outstanding. That's insane. And That's it, insane. And it, well, and it picked the pocket of the Dole Food shareholders. That's what I don't understand. I was, I, I've tried to get you know, prosecutors to go after that because the vast majority of that was nefarious. There were, there were people who knew that the bookkeeping systems didn't reconcile and that they would be able to double dip, that they sold the shares in the final couple of trading days of the company being outstanding, but, the, but that the bookkeeping systems wouldn't keep up and they wouldn't probably get caught. And you know what? They got away with it because to my knowledge, I don't think anybody's ever been prosecuted, but that's a perfect example. And by the way, I also realized after I figured out what happened, that happens in every single M&A transaction, every single one. Um, I'll be a probably not to that degree, but people are getting their pockets picked. And yeah. so, you know, the way, the way to get around that is let's go to an honest ledger system. That's why I loved your story about Steve Wozniak. He was hitting on some of those same, those well, same things. And, and I let's think there are a lot of, there are a lot of yeah. industries like that. So I have a client who works in the music industry. And when he was telling me some stories that like way back when, so I don't know, I'm, I'm an old 80s girl, but Casablanca Records, I don't know if you remember them, but he was telling the story. Course, yeah. yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah. So they were telling the story that they were doing this, you know, uh, system by which they would ship records, like over ship the amount of records to record stores. And then the record stores oh. would get phone calls because that's how the system used to work. Phone calls from the local DJs who weren't sure if they should play the record. And they would, they were that what they would say is, Oh yeah, we just got shipped in three cases of, you know, whatever the record is. And so then the DJs would go, okay, I guess we're going to play this record that I don't really love, but it sounds like they're being really well shipped. But what happened was, is that that was, so all of the, the billboard charts and all of those things were being recorded on shipments not on what actually sold. Oh, and so oh. they could return them. Yeah. And so okay. there was so no reconciliation. Right. Yeah. It, 
And it was, and I worked for, I worked for 25, over 25 years in the product industry. So mass market sales, Costco, Walmart, Target, like all of that. And we used to say that, you know, doing business with the office superstore sometimes was like working with the mafia. Like it was, you know, it was like, if you want to keep your position and at the end of the year, you're going to have to pay for all our ad losses. And we decided what the ads were, you know, Office Depot decides what the ads were, Office Max, and sorry, but you're going to have to make us whole if you want to keep your spot for next year. Like, that's the kind of stuff that would go on in these industries. And you'd be like, wait a second, did you really ship that much? Did that really happen? Like, none of that is being tracked. So I see a lot of industries ripe for disruption. And I mean, right. it's not like there aren't already cracks in brick and mortar retail, right? There's, a, there's like entire oh, totally. foundations yeah. missing right now. So, yeah. you know, they're right yeah. for that. So that's where I think you, well, you guys have set a system that is going to be a great foundational for some of these new disruptive entities. Yeah. You know, I mean, all these things, we, we recognize them as soft fraud, right? But they're legal. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, you gave just a great example of what's going on in, uh, what went on in the music industry. Um, the, the track and trace companies that are doing this for food provenance, uh, the stories that come out of that, that, you know, the, the, the stuff that's marketed as organic that really isn't, um, is a significant percentage higher than the stuff that actually oh, is. And I'm getting really um, you know, scared by cannabis industry from the stories I'm hearing from people in that industry well, as well. I mean, look what's going on with the people getting, you know, tainted vape um, from the street, right? Um, Yeah, there's no question that that I think this technology can help um, in the track and trace area. And that's where it's taken off. I'm not surprised that it's taken off there, that those those supply chain provenance businesses, because it, it, it is technology that can help in that regard. And that really is enterprise. You don't need the truly decentralized systems for that. Um, but, but, um, in the financial services industry, you know, the, 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 I gave you the Dole food case, which was very, very, fairly recent. It was a Delaware court case in 2017. Um, but, but just in 2019, another example of this, just to give you an idea that this is ongoing and very current is the Uber IPO. The Uber IPO made a lot of headlines because it traded so poorly in the aftermarket, right? It was a terrible IPO. A lot of investors lost a lot of money. I think the stock was down like 20% on the first day. It just happened again with, uh, with another IPO this week. And, and, and I worked in the equities business for a long time, worked on big IPOs you know, of years ago. And so IPOs generally didn't do that. They didn't really blow up like that. So my question was, why are they blowing up like this all of a sudden? These big IPOs are are trading so poorly in the market. Well, of course, there's an answer. And that is that the SEC in uh, 2017 allowed the investment banks in underwritten transactions to sell more shares in the offering than are legally issued and outstanding. It's called naked short selling. So it's the same thing we're just talking about. Um, And and I am shocked at this, right? Because the SEC is supposed to be a consumer protection industry. And yet that is evidence, you know, exhibit A, that they are captured by the regulators or captured by the industry rather. Um, that, that, That this is something that the industry wanted because IPOs are really risky. And that used to put a lot of discipline on the underwriters to not overprice them so that they didn't <laughs> trade, trade down in the secondary market. Um, and because if they did, the investment banks lost their shirts. They were, it was a high risk, high reward business. Um, and every once in a while, they'd lose their shirts. But in almost all IPOs, the stocks traded up. And that's, that's why. And the market worked. Well, now since the SEC is allowing the three card Monty game to be happening. It's heads, heads I win, tails I win for the investment banks and the consumers are the ones who lose. Right. Um, and, and so what's interesting is when I was digging into Wyoming, I sat down with the president of the Senate who's an attorney and he said, oh, this is, I, I, there's a Supreme Court case, case about this in Wyoming. And I said, what? And he, he laid it out there. Sure enough, there was a guy convicted of criminal fraud for rehypothecating a an industrial diamond. Rehypothecation is basically taking an asset, pledging it for a loan, and then taking the same asset and pledging it for a different loan. And that is standard practice in, in the bond market, especially US treasuries. The average US treasury is claimed by three different people, but there's only one US treasury, right? So again, three card Monty, musical chairs, whatever you wanna call it. But in Wyoming, there's a Supreme Court case litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court that says, if you do that, you've committed criminal fraud. 
And it was a felony for um, this guy because it was worth more than $10,000. I'm waiting for a state because most state fraud laws actually consider all the things you and I have just been talking about to be fraud. And yet it's very, very rarely prosecuted. I'm waiting for a state to actually go out and prosecute it in the financial services industry because it is ripe for prosecution. And some state's attorney general is going to make a name for him or herself by doing this. And, and good on them for doing it because that will actually be standing up for the rights of the little guy and mom and pop. Um, and ultimately, you know, frankly, we should all stand for honest ledgers. Why, why are we tolerating dishonesty in bookkeeping systems? Yeah, I agree with you. You know, I also think it's really interesting that you guys are already having tests of the of the entities, of the laws, of the things that are going into place. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that's where, for some people, limited liability companies started falling apart, especially. So I had a, an LLC in Rhode Island back in 2000, a little okay. bit earlier that I formed it. Um, and, uh, and then we moved to New York State, and it just destroyed everything that we had we had set in place and we we should have incorporated because new york uh, state just did not they had too much precedent set in, within the state of uh, of how they treated the the members and so it actually you know essentially messed with our corporation and messed with our oh company no. and so i wished i had understood that but who who would have known that these things were going through you form it and then you aren't always working with the company that you formed it with or the, the, especially when you move states. And so yeah. I should have gotten a new advisor and I didn't know that and wished that we had incorporated it at that stage. Yeah. Luckily we yeah. sold everything off and we were okay, but, um, but it just, it messed with my members and I, I was like, wow, but you have to get testing happening and, and testing of what the laws are working in and how they are built in practice. And I think you guys are already starting that at such an early stage. And I think that's really yep. important. Well, and that's where the case law comes into effect. It is important to get a good lawyer. <laughs> um, you know, as you, as you said, it, you know, when you moved to New York, if you'd had a good lawyer, they pro probably could have saved you some of the, yes. some, some of the hassle. It's just, um, unfortunately, it's a cost of doing business. Laws are complicated, just like code is complicated. There are bugs in the laws, just like there are bugs in the code. Um, but you don't want to screw it up. It'll, because the downside of screwing it up, it's going to cost you more to fix it later. Yeah. One of the things I want to touch on before we go is your sandbox. So I think most yeah. people don't understand how critically important that is, but I'm always on the innovation edge of companies, like starting up in the beginning of them. And it's so critically important when we're reinventing practically everything to have a sandbox opportunity. And I think having a fintech sandbox is, is brilliant because that's where there are so many regulations and there are so many things going on that it's making it difficult for you to develop great technologies and innovation that is going to to yeah. be of great benefit long-term in terms of our financial processing. So that, I mean, that's pretty cutting edge stuff that you guys have done there. Talk a little bit about how that yeah. came about. Yeah. And to my knowledge, nobody's applied for it yet. Oh, they yeah. should. <laughs> well, it, 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 um, candidly, we were copying Arizona. Yeah. Yeah. We were copying Arizona. So we can't claim credit for that one. A lot of what Wyoming's done, we've been first mover, but, but on that one, we weren't. Um, and and uh, Arizona's had a few companies apply. Um, so I think in, and the law I think just took effect in uh, July 1st. So it's still early days. But um, part of it is that Wyoming has such uh, light touch regulation anyway that, um, that it, you know, we're not like New York or California where the sandbox is probably more meaningful because there is not likely that heavy handed regulation to begin with in Wyoming. But what it does is it basically says, Pretty much with the exception of the consumer protection and fraud requirements, um, you can do anything in, in Wyoming as long as you let the regulator know who you are, what you're doing, and, you, and you're probably going to have to post a surety bond. There's a requirement in the law to do that just to make sure that you're not a total fraudster. Um, and once you, once you do those things, you basically have a safe haven, a safe harbor for two years initially, and it can be extended for a third year. And the thought process there is that um, if there's a new business that doesn't currently comply with the law, but is a good idea and is worth trying, and it's not going to rip, rip off customers, then, you know, if it's really that good of a, of, a, of a business, then Wyoming's probably going to make it legal within two to three years anyway. Um, Arizona, I think, only had a one-year um, um, sandbox so one year really isn't enough time to that's get a, a little short in development yeah. um, so 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the other thing we did, which Arizona, I believe, didn't, um, is that we made it reciprocal with foreign government sandboxes. So the UK has one and Bermuda has one. And Bermuda um, reached out to us because they are also a very respected but light touch financial services regulated um, jurisdiction. I used to run a couple of Bermuda insurance companies. So I'm very familiar with Bermuda. The Bermuda Monetary Authority in, in insurance and reinsurance really is truly world class. And so it's interesting, they're making a play for, for blockchain as well. And, um, and, and so, you know, literally a company can string together um, businesses between the EU passported through Bermuda and then the UK uh, and, and, and then the US by going into these sandboxes. And, you know, I've interviewed a few fintech app companies and things like that, that they chose to go straight out to another country to do, um, you know, the sure. one a good example of that is um, Walla and the yeah. dollar, that coin that they've created. And, you know, they're trying to serve an underbanked and underserved community. Right. And she wanted to do it because she had you know, she was seeing the, you know, her family from Mexico trying to send money and, and trying to deal with this. And, and so she was seeing this happening yeah. and thinking that she wanted to serve her local community, but the regulations were just so strong. She couldn't test out her proof of concept. She couldn't, you right. know, deal with the regular. And so she couldn't stay in business and deal with trying to change regulation at the same time. And so she chose to go yeah. out of country. And I think that's a shame for us to be able to not find these new things that might be working in our community and being able to, uh, to have the time and the commitment to changing those regulations overall and proving that our model will work and it's safe and it's not defrauding anyone. So I, yeah. I love the idea of you guys doing that because, I, you know, whether it's fintech or in any other area, a sandbox can be a very important proving ground and important to really yeah. moving our innovation forward. And I think there's a lot to prove here in crypto and in, in blockchain that needs, you know, it needs a safe haven to do that in. Well, and what's interesting is, is Wyoming is being viewed effectively as a sandbox by the feds. <laughs> they are not shutting down what Wyoming is doing in the banking industry. So the special purpose depository institutions, the, the Wyoming bank regulator has done extensive work with the Kansas City Fed. They are almost like, you know, they're pretty certain to approve an application. Nothing's certain until somebody actually shows up and applies. But... Um, but 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 they even commented on the statute before it was um, enacted into law. So they've been a partner of the Wyoming Banking Division, and what they're doing effectively is saying, "All right, we're going to let Wyoming do this, and we're going to watch, and we're going to see if this works. And if it does work, then you know." In I heard a number. I won't attribute it to. It's not. It didn't come from the Fed, but it did come from a regulator in D.C. who said. If this works in three to five years, we may loosen the, the, the federal regulations. So um, it's not official that Wyoming's a sandbox for, uh, for, for all the banking and payment stuff uh, because we've not been given that title, but de facto, that's what, that's what is happening here. Everything that Wyoming is doing, though, is it, it complies with, with federal law. Um, so it's not like we need an exemption from federal law. So maybe it, that isn't an apt analogy because we don't need any exemptions. It's, um, state chartered banks have been around for more than a century, and there's actually really good federal law about how other states have to respect other states' state chartered banks. So uh, that's it's it, you watch. I think um, that Wyoming state chartered banks um, will end up obviating the need for a bit license in New York. Nobody has actually tested this yet, but there's very good reason to believe that that's the case. Interesting. And again, it's because state <laughs> chartered banks have been around a long time. There's a lot of precedent and a lot of law. Well, Caitlin, your energy and your excitement about this space just, you know, gets to me every time I see you. So how can someone find out more information and follow what's going on? Because things are changing every day. You're getting new rulings happening and things are going on. Where can we follow that and where can we find out more? So the, um, I'm very active on Twitter. That's probably the best place for the day to day. Uh, I also have a pinned tweet that has a, a link to a Forbes.com article I wrote that summarizes the Wyoming legislation if you'd like to start there. And uh, uh, caitlin-long.com is a blog that, uh, that I post uh, articles on. I'm working on a book, although I have no idea when that'll get done. And uh, in the meantime, um, check me on social media. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. 
Wonderful, which is how we connected actually. So, so yeah, so great. Well, I will have that Forbes article and links to your Twitter and, and Facebook and, and LinkedIn and your website and all of that in the blog post for this episode. Awesome. So if you're, if you're listening to this while you're in the car, please don't stop, you know, don't get in an accident. Uh, don't write it down. I'll have that for you. And that will be at <laughs> newtrusteconomy.com. So Caitlin, Fantastic. is there anything, is there anything on the forefront, anything on the future, anything that you're excited about that might be coming up that, that you want us to watch for? Yeah, we actually have seven more bills that we've proposed for the 2020 legislative session. They've got to wind their way through a long process. Um, and, and a couple of them are really interesting. One is that if your private keys are in Wyoming, that a, a, a judge, whether it's criminal or civil or administrative, cannot compel you to disclose your private keys. That's one proposal. They can compel you to move the assets. They can compel you to sign digitally to prove you own something, but they cannot compel you to um, reveal your private keys. We acknowledge that private keys are not like a regular password. Once you reveal them, they're permanently compromised. They probably um, unlock a lot more assets than a divorce settlement might you know, somebody might be entitled to in a divorce settlement, for example. And so compelling the actual release of the private key is something that we wanted to protect. Now that's going to be a controversial one. I'm not sure we're going to get it through, but that, that is going to be really, controversial. <laughs> right. But that really, truly, you know, plants a flag in the sand that Wyoming is protective of, of this industry. And the second one is for developers along those lines. Um, there, we passed a, a bill through the task force that says that why, you, you cannot be criminally charged merely for writing a line of code in the state of Wyoming. Um, so if, if you are maliciously using your code or somebody else's code, of course you can still be criminally charged, but merely writing the code, it's, it's protected speech effectively in the state of Wyoming. You, you can't be criminally charged for it. That one got a very, very loud round of applause from developers, open source developers so often use um, pseudonyms because they are afraid of, of mostly criminal but also civil liability uh, for, for their code being misused. And so uh, what we're trying to do, again, is just plant the flag. This is the, this is the state that gets it, and this is the place where you want to be. This is the place where you want to set up your business. We're going to treat you the best. Uh, and I, after 29 years, I moved back here to Wyoming <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I truly believe there's more opportunity for the financial technology sector here in Wyoming than there is in New York, for sure. <laughs> I don't blame you at all. And, and the countryside is beautiful there. Indeed. <laughs> so, Indeed it is. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think most people don't realize how close like big cities in Colorado are as yeah. well, right across the border. So I mean, there, there's all kinds of, of things to, to think about and look about whether you want to actually domicile there or start banking there or what you're going to do with it and, and with the, how you're going to organize your business and what you're going to do. So Caitlin, Indeed. thank you thank so you. much this for being fun. a I'm really glad that we finally got a chance to connect. I'm glad the audience has gotten a chance to see and hear all the excitement about what's going on in Wyoming. And we will keep in touch. And when some new things come on, we'll, make, we'll be sure to notify the audience and maybe do another episode in the near future. I'd like that. Thank you very much. So everyone, this is Tracy Hazard and New Trust Economy, and I'm excited to bring you this episode today. And I am so glad that you are all thinking about the future because you've been messaging us. You've been uh, talking with us on Facebook and uh, Instagram, basically at New Trust Economy. And of course, at our website, newtrusteconomy.com. And you've been sending us questions and messages, and we really appreciate that. And we look forward to bringing you interesting new uh, topics and interesting new people like Caitlin. Thanks everyone for listening. This is Tracy Hazard. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.